Welcome everyone. We'll take just um, just a minute or so to have everyone join in. Hi everybody. Welcome. If you're just joining, we'll just take a minute to get everybody logged in here. Welcome everybody. All right. I think we will go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone so much for joining us today. All right. Welcome to Hawk Mountain Sanctuary's uh, Stay at Home Speaker Series. Today's program is Uncovering the Mysteries of the Snowy Owl South of the Tundra with Hawk Mountain's own research biologist, Dr. Rebecca McCabe. Hi, Rebecca. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Riley Davenport. I'm an educator and raptor specialist here at Hawk Mountain, and we're so glad that you're joining us today. Um, just to give you a little bit of information about Hawk Mountain before we get started. Hawk Mountain is the world's very first sanctuary for birds of prey, and we continue to work hard to be leaders in raptor conservation, science, and education locally and globally around the world. Hawk Mountain is a private nonprofit, and membership is the lifeblood of our organization. And to all of our members, thank you so much for your uh, continued support. And if you're joining us today and you're not a member, we hope that you consider becoming one in the future. Hawk Mountain hopes that everyone has been remaining safe and healthy during these times of COVID challenges, and we're excited to offer local and global um, programming, free virtual programming to all of you. And we always greatly appreciate and depend on donations. Just so everyone is aware, today's program will be recorded. This video will be accessible on our Hawk Mountain YouTube channel, usually in a couple days, and you can check out our YouTube channel to use this as a continued resource. We also have a link on our website directly connecting to our YouTube channel. Uh, Any time during today's program, you can click on the bottom there. There's a Q&A feature at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and you can submit questions that you have for Rebecca at any time, and we will try and answer a few at the end. And yeah, we're so excited that Rebecca is joining us today. And before we get started, I'm going to give you a little bit of background information about Rebecca. So after completing her 2014 conservation science traineeship at Hawk Mountain, she went on to receive her master's studying the nesting behavior of broadwing hawks, and then immediately pursued her PhD studying snowy owl ecology and survival rate in winter. Rebecca joined the staff full-time in 2021, serving as a biologist in the sanctuary's new American Kestrel research and the expanded broadwing hawk study, and as well as examining the status of snowy owls globally. She also serves as a mentor to trainees and assists in all areas of conservation science outreach and research. So, so exciting. Thank you so much again, Rebecca, for joining us today. Um, I do have a um, couple quick questions for you before we get started. Um, my first question for you is how you heard about Hawk Mountain, how you got involved here at the sanctuary. Yeah, thanks, Riley. So I was actually in my undergrad at Millersville University and my professor and mentor at the time, Dr. John Wallace, um, told me about Hawk Mountain and he said, you have to go check it out. He was a former trainee as well. And so I drove up here one day, checked out the sanctuary and just immediately fell in love with the place. Awesome. And before we dive into learning about the snowy owl research, is there any other exciting research projects that you'd like to plug or like mention before we get started? 
Yes, yes. Uh, I've been involved with um, our Broadwing Hop research here since 2014. And I just joined uh, the team uh, studying American kestrels. And so there's a lot of cool stuff that we're doing here at the sanctuary, from uh, tagging birds to looking at contaminants and habitat and everything. So I just encourage viewers, if you're interested in learning about those projects, to check out Hawk Mountain's website for more information. Awesome. All right. Well, I'm going to give you the floor. You're welcome to uh, start sharing your screen and we will go ahead and get started. Perfect. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Everything look good on your end? Yep. Looks good. Okay. Perfect. <laughs> I was like, I can't see you, so I don't know. All right. Well, thank you, Riley, for the kind introduction. And thank you, everyone, for tuning into my talk this evening. I'm really excited to share with all of you some of my findings for my PhD research. So many of you may recognize this bird as Harry Potter's faithful companion, Hedwig. Maybe a few of you have been lucky enough to catch a glimpse of the snowy owl through the airplane window as you were taxiing the tarmac. And maybe for others, this might be a life bird, one that you desperately hope to see this far south during the winter months. This evening, I'm gonna talk about the research my colleagues and I have been doing over the last couple of years. But my main goal is that many, if not all of you, walk away today learning something new about the snowy owl. But first, I thought I would provide a bit of backstory. So this is a very happy me in 2014, holding my first ever wild snowy owl. I just started my master's studying nesting broadwing hawks and simultaneously became a conservation science trainee here at Hawk Mountain. So to get more hands-on raptor field experience, I participated in a one week raptor field techniques course in Wisconsin where I had my first encounter with the snowy owl. I assisted the course instructor, Jean Jacobs, with banding and measuring this owl, and I watched in awe as it took flight back into the wild. The entire workshop was a really great experience, but that encounter with the snowy owl was something special. Fast forward to the fall of 2016, and I'm sitting at North Lookout with Hawk Mountain's Dr. J.F. Therrien, counting migrants and chatting about my future plans. J.F. mentioned the work Project Snowstorm was doing and how there was an opportunity for a potential PhD project using Project Snowstorm's winter tracking data. How could I say no? So one year later, I officially joined Project Snowstorm. I really did not see that one coming. So for those of you that don't know, Project Snowstorm is one of the world's largest collaborative research projects focusing on snowy owls. It's staffed by a volunteer team of scientists, banders, and wildlife veterinarians. Project Snowstorm was founded in 2013 alongside that big eruption year. And what's really cool about Project Snowstorm is that the work we do is funded by our generous and supportive followers. So a big shout out to all of those, all of you who have contributed once or numerous times over the years. Thank you. So after joining this amazing team in 2017, I moved to our neighbor to the north and started my PhD at McGill University in Southern Canada in Dr. Kyle Elliott's Arctic Ecology Lab. So why study the snowy owl? Well, the snowy owl is an important predator in Arctic ecosystems, and there are still many things that we don't know about their behavior and ecology. In the Arctic, snowy owls nest on the open tundra and feed mainly on these little guys, lemmings. In years when there is a high abundance of lemmings on the Arctic breeding grounds, resulting in higher nest success, an abundance of healthy young owls will fledge. The photo on the top right shows approximately 70 dead lemmings surrounding a snowy owl nest with unhatched eggs in the center. Lots of food for growing owlets to consume. 
Now, with that large number of individuals in the population, mainly juvenile owls will make their way further south in winter in what is known as an eruption. This causes a frenzy among birders and owl enthusiasts. We see an increase in reports of eBird sightings and the media gets pretty creative with their catchy headlines. Things like, hold on to your bins, another blizzard of snowy owls could be coming. Calling all bird watchers, rare snowy owl eruption grips Toronto. Eruption makes this the year to see snowy owls. A snowy owl bonanza, thanks to a little stubby-legged Arctic rodent, the lemming. And my personal favorite, Detroit is being invaded by Arctic snowy owls. Who are they and what do they want? <laughs> So in 2013, Project Snowstorm, along with other researchers, took advantage of owls this far south, and they decided to trap and ban wintering owls. This involved identifying locations of wintering owls or driving around and searching for owls on the landscape. This is definitely a task that benefits from a trained eye, as you can tell from the good camouflage of the owl in this photo. So once owls were trapped by authorized personnel, a 40 gram GPS GSM solar powered transmitter was affixed to owls in good body condition using a lightweight backpack harness. So to give you an idea, this device weighs about as much as seven US quarters or a little less than your average chicken egg. And since 2013, Project Snowstorm has deployed over 100 transmitters on wintering owls in the US and Canada. So for my PhD research, I focus strictly on the overwintering period when snowy owls migrate south into human dominated landscapes, and especially at the most Southern part of their winter and eruptive range seen here highlighted in orange. This period accounts for over half of the annual cycle and few studies have examined winter behavior of snowy owls, making this important research to fill in the knowledge gaps of snowy owl ecology. So with access to Project Snowstorm's substantial data set of 100 telemetry tagged owls, I was ready to address some of my research questions. First, I just wanted to know how snowy owls are moving on the landscape in winter and what factors are driving their movements. Using a subsample of 50 tagged owls grouped into three geographic regions, the prairies, the Great Lakes, and the Atlantic coast, I assess their movement patterns based on intrinsic factors such as the sex and age of the owl and extrinsic factors such as different, cover, different types of land cover. I found that owls were both nomadic meaning that they moved continuously throughout the winter, and resident, meaning that they were restricted to a small area during the winter period. I found that nomadic owls had a wintering range of about 200 square kilometers compared to the resident owls, which had a winter range of about 20 square kilometers. I found that nomadism was more likely to occur for owls wintering in the eastern part of their range and at southern latitudes. When looking at land cover composition around the owls wintering sites, I found that range residency was more likely to occur as the proportion of cropland increases within their wintering site. More specifically, owls wintering in the prairies where rodents are likely abundant were more often resident compared to owls wintering in the Great Lakes and Atlantic coast. This suggests that prey availability and resources may be more variable in fragmented or human, domin human dominated landscapes. And I'd just like to take a moment to give a shout out to Impact Media Lab for designing this really cool interact interactive infographic that summarizes the findings from this study. 
So in summary, owls were pretty variable in their movements and winter movement was driven likely by the distribution and availability of prey and not so much the sex or age class of the owl. Next, I wanted to assess survival during the winter period. <clears throat> I wanted to know what the causes of death were for wintering owls <clears throat> and if survival differed for immature birds wintering in eruptive versus non-eruptive years. For this analysis, I used 185 individuals tagged with tracking devices. This includes the about 100 or so from Project Snowstorm, as well as tagged owls from other collaborators. I estimated winter survival for telemetry tracked owls and compared the causes of mortality with over 350 necropsied owls that were turned into veterinary facilities in Eastern North America since as early as 2013. What I found was that anthropogenic mortality was almost two times greater than natural mortality for both telemetry tracked owls and necropsied owls. The top known causes of death included automobile collisions, which accounted for 22% and 18% of owl deaths in our study. The second top cause of death was airplane collisions, which accounted for 11 and 9% of owl deaths in our study. I also wanted to see at what point in the winter period was mortality occurring. And from this graph here, we have the probability of mortality on the y-axis and months on the x-axis. And we can see that probability of mortality was greatest during the months of December and January, so early in the winter period. And this was especially true for immature birds. We can see that the probability of mortality decreased over the winter period but the probability of mortality was fairly low and constant throughout winter for adult birds. As mentioned, I wanted to compare survival for immature birds in eruptive versus non-eruptive years. And to do this, I used Christmas bird count data to determine eruptive years in Eastern North America, seen here as red dots. I would like to acknowledge all of you that participate in Christmas bird counts, um, as hopefully you can see that all of your early mornings and dedication to counting winter birds is going to a good cause. So what I found was that immature birds wintering in eruptive years had considerably lower survival than owls wintering in non-eruptive years. You can see the survival probability on the y-axis with one representing no mortality for immatures wintering in non-eruptive years, seen here in this blue-green color, compared to the decreasing survival probability for immatures in eruptive years, seen here in the red-pink color. So by the end of the winter period, about 50% of the immature owls wintering in eruptive years did not survive. In summary, I found that immature owls that erupt into Eastern North America are likely limited by density dependent factors like competition from more owls on the winter landscape, which in turn forces them into risky human dominated areas where survival decreases. Next, I wanted to look more in depth at snowy owls at airports, as it's a pretty hot topic and one of the top causes of mortality for wintering owls. My main question was to see if relocation is an effective management or conservation technique for this species. And one question I'm often asked is, why do snowy owls like airports so much? And we think, that airports may be perceived by owls to mimic flat, open habitats resembling the Arctic tundra. These treeless airfields coupled with an abundance of small mammals is an appealing wintering site that can support multiple overwintering owls as well as other raptors. But snowy owls pose a serious strike risk because of their large body size, 
flight characteristics, and hunting behavior. You can see here from this photo with the wings expanded, this is a big bird. And since 2019, the Federal Aviation Administration reported over 250 snowy owl collisions from over 55 different airports in the United States and Canada. And these collisions are estimated to cost upwards of $2.8 million. So because snowy owls pose a threat to air safety and are known to be regular winter residents at many airports across North America, private industry and federal wildlife agencies have been capturing and relocating snowy owls for many years now. So for this study, I assessed relocation data from owls that were trapped at 13 airports in the United States and Canada between 2000 and 2020. These owls were affixed with transmitters and released at various sites surrounding the airports that the owls were captured at. Here is a map just showing you the 13 airports seen here as orange plain symbols. And then we have the release sites of the 42 owls indicated by black dots and dashed lines connecting the airport to the associated release site. Of the 42 owls in our study, there was an even split of adults and immatures with slightly more females than males in each age class. There was also an overall 67 success, success rate for relocation, meaning that 67% of the owls that were trapped and relocated did not return to the airport during the same winter period. So I ran a series of statistical tests to see what variables influence return rates. Things like the sex and age of the owl, the distance and the direction of the release site, and the different types of land cover composition within the relocation sites. And what I found was that immature females and adult males were less likely to return than adult females and immature males. I found that the greater the distance you moved an owl away from the airport, the less likely it would be to return. And finally, I found that as the proportion of wetlands and croplands increases at the release site, the less likely an owl would be to return. I also wanted to share a few other interesting things that came from looking at owl airport relocations. First, I was curious to know if an owl does return to the airport, how long does it take it to return? So we had some birds that returned within just a few hours after being relocated and others that took upwards of two months to return. However, the average amount of time to return was about 17 days. And here this map is just showing an example of one bird that was relocated from the Montreal airport and it was relocated just outside of Montreal indicated by that yellow star. And we can see the movements in red as it made its way back to the airport one week later. Something that warrants for the research is assessing the movements of owls when they're on the airfield. For example, this is Yule, an adult female that we captured at the Montreal airport and released at a nearby site. However, Yule returned to the airport, but because she was sporting that fancy tracking device, we were able to capture her movements on the airfield. And this is really neat because we may actually be able to identify some of these high risk areas where collisions occur and where owls are congregating. Um, and these movement data may help managers to mitigate future collisions. So definitely more research is needed here. So of the 14 owls that returned to the airport in our study, two were killed by a collision or jet blast. So because the owls were wearing transmitters, we were able to see their movements and identify the site where mortality likely occurred, seen here by this yellow star. So the map on the left shows an individual that was trapped at the Boston Logan International Airport in Massachusetts. This bird returned and you can see its movements in the red dots kind of at the southern part of the um, airport. And then unfortunately the bird was killed by a jet blast uh, near one of the major runways. 
We also have another individual that was tagged at the Philadelphia International Airport here in Pennsylvania. And that bird returned and kind of moved all around the airport, but was later killed um, after hitting, uh, colliding with a plane near one of the major runways. But onto a more hopeful side of airport relocations, I wanted to share the story of Yule, the adult female from two slides ago. Um, this bird was captured and tagged at the Montreal airport in 2019. After being relocated for a second time during that same winter, Yule spent the rest of the winter period outside of Montreal, Quebec. Come spring, she migrated north and nested in the Ungava Peninsula in Northern Quebec. The following fall, she returned to Southern Quebec in December, 2020, before heading north once again in April, 2021. On January 9th, Yule checked in, revealing her tracking data, showing that she spent the summer in Southampton Island in Nunavut, Canada, and she returned to Southern Canada for yet another winter. So now if we zoom in on Yule's winter movements over the years, we can see the first winter of tracking data in pink after her second relocation. So Yule bounced around quite a bit, but did not return to the airport for the rest of that winter. And the really cool thing is that instead of heading back to the airport the following winter, Yule flew directly to the area that she was relocated to outside of Drummond, Quebec, seen here in orange. And she wintered about 30 kilometers or so from the previous year's wintering site. So this winter, uh, Yule returned south again, and we can see her much smaller wintering range in yellow. Um, and again, no return to the Montreal airport thus far. So although this is just one example, I can't help but to wonder that if owls are relocated in suitable habitats, will they be less likely to return to the airport, not only during the same winter period, but also in years that follow? I'm really excited that we at Project Snowstorm are continuing our airport relocation work with colleagues in Quebec and elsewhere in the US. This winter, we've deployed three units on adult females trapped at the Montreal airport. And we're now testing the protocols from our recent findings related to distance, habitat types, and the sex and age of the owl to see if those individual owls return to the airport. So stay tuned for more of our airport relocation work in the near future. So in summary, I found that both intrinsic factors such as the sex and age of the owl and extrinsic factors like land cover types and distance need to be considered when relocating owls from airports. The hope is that by implementing these relocation protocols, we will see a reduction in return rates and potentially mitigate future collisions. I also wanted to highlight the work of a student I co-supervised at McGill, Andrea Brown. Andrea looked at the spring migratory movements of tagged snowy owls to see if migration phenology differed among sex and age classes and to see where stopovers were occurring along their migratory journey. She found that adults completed migration earlier than immatures and that the majority of stopovers occurred at the beginning of migration compared to the end suggesting that snowy owls do not necessarily use stopovers to select summer settlement or breeding sites, but instead use them for resting and feeding on migration. If you wanna learn more about Andrea's findings, I encourage you to check out our publication in the journal IBIS. Also, I really love this great little gif that she made showing the migratory movements of males and females um, throughout the spring. So I feel very fortunate that I get to continue working with this species here at Hawk Mountain and to be leading a global status assessment of snowy owls with collaborators from all over the world. Um, snowy owls are listed as vulnerable by the International Union for Conservation of Nature and with unknown population trends um, and global estimates of about 14,000 pairs in the wild, 
there is a need for a status assessment. Um, it's really imperative for the conservation of this species, especially with threats from climate change and human development throughout its circumpolar range. So now maybe after hearing me talk about my PhD research and things that are going on with snowies during their overwinter period, you're thinking to yourself, oh man, Becca, but like what, what can I do as somebody um, to help snowy owls? And so the one really important thing you can do is give owls their space. Many of us forget because we are so captivated by this Arctic visitor that we forget how our actions can influence the behavior of the owl. So try to keep your distance. If you notice a massive group of people maybe coming, maybe in the area, maybe come back later. And if you see that the owl is restless, constantly looking around, getting up and flying to different spots, the best thing would be to leave and let the owl be. Another really important thing you can do um, is educate others about the importance of owls and their roles in their ecosystems. Um, just sharing your enthusiasm and your joy that owls bring to you is, is a really a great thing that you can do. Another thing I would recommend is supporting your local rehab or vet facility, as these are the people caring for the sick or injured owls. And so if you can make donations or just um, support them in whatever way, that's a great way to help owls too. And finally, you can support organizations just like Hawk Mountain and Project Snowstorm um, that have these ongoing research projects um, and are continuing to study these majestic birds and to learn more and find ways in which we can, can conserve and protect them. So I would like to finish today by saying that I feel very grateful to have had the opportunity to study snowy owls for my PhD and that I can continue to do so into my career. And from everything that I've learned over the last four years, Rachel Carson's quote really resonates with me. I'll read you her quote. She said, conservation is a cause that has no end and there is no point at which we will say our work is finished. And so I would like to thank all of these amazing people and organizations who contributed to this work, from all of the people out trapping owls um, to the people funding this research and everything in between. Um, a huge shout out to all of my colleagues at Project Snowstorm, um, my fabulous co-supervisors, Karen and JF, and committee members, Jill and Kyle. Um, this research is truly collaborative, and I am really grateful for everyone who has contributed along the way. And I would also just like to plug um, my colleague and former co-supervisor, Dr. Karen Weave's talk that will be occurring next Thursday, February 24th at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And if you tune into that, you'll be able to learn more about the movements and habitat use of wintering snowy owls on the prairies. So um, with that, I would be happy to take any questions. Awesome. Thank you so much, Rebecca. That was an awesome presentation. Um, I do have a couple um, questions lined up from the um, Q&A section. So if anyone has a question now, it's a great opportunity to go down. If you have a question you can think of, type it in. I'll go through a few that we have now. Um, the first one is from R. Melton. And they said, thank you for a very informative and inspiring insight into the lives of the snowy owl. Can snowy owls adapt to the future climate change? How do you think this will impact their food, habitat, or nesting? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, here, let me just end my um, screen so you can see me again. Can you see me okay? All good? Um, is there a, there should be a stop share button at the bottom of your screen. There we go. I got it. <laughs> Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, we're, we're not sure how well snowies will adapt to climate change. 
Um, of course, the, the warming of the temperature is, is really um, thought to be going to be impacting their prey, lemmings. Um, lemmings need snow. And so without snow, it might alter um, the prey abundance. And so the one hopeful thing is that um, in the avian species, they're mobile. And so um, depending on how things change in the Arctic, maybe the species would be able to adapt further south. But there's just still a lot of unknowns, hence why we're doing this research. Mm -hmm. Um, well, speaking of them moving south, my next question is <clears throat> from someone who asked, what is the farthest south that snowy owls have been seen? Ooh, this is like a good, this is a good trivia question. <laughs> um, what it was in, I believe it was in that 2013, 14 eruption year. Why do I want to say Bermuda? But that could be, that could be wrong. That's a good question. And that's a a fun fact I should know. So <laughs> um, this next question from Diane Allison asks, could you speak about what snowy owls are eating in the winter time? Oh, thanks, MT. <laughs> Sorry, Bermuda is correct. <laughs> um, yeah, so they're eating uh, lots of voles. Voles are a big favorite of them, um, other small mammals. And so, um, yeah, they've been seen taking ducks as well and waterfowl. So yeah, it's, it's cool to, to know that as a species that's a specialist on their breeding grounds is kind of becoming more of a generalist on their wintering grounds. So because we don't have lemmings here, they have to adapt and, and eat something else. So awesome. Um, the next question here is currently a snowy owl in Lancaster has remained in the same area for over a month. Is this typical? Why does the owl not fly away from spectators? So every owl is unique <laughs> and some owls will not tolerate any human presence. I mean, I've driven past an owl and that's flushed it. Um, sometimes um, some are more tolerable and others aren't. And it's kind of, you know, you sort of want to treat them all the same in the sense that it is a wild animal and we don't want to encroach on their space. And so although that owl is hanging around, it's probably because maybe it is an okay wintering spot and there's food there and it's you know not being pressured too much by the people but at the same time it's hard to say that maybe it's just tolerating them and um is just is hanging around because there's nowhere else to go too so yeah awesome and so many great questions everybody thank you yeah. so much um the next question is if you know um what the greatest number of times an individual bird has been recorded returning to the same wintering location? So yeah, so definitely tune in to next week's talk because Karen will definitely talk about that. It seems that um, owls are tending to return, they have a little bit more, I don't even wanna call it site fidelity, but some owls will continuously come back to um, the same wintering area. It may not necessarily be that same pasture or field, but kind of within that same vicinity, just like Yule. So I know there's been birds that have returned um, more than five years, um, but that max number, I'm, I'm not too certain of. Mm. Um, let's see here, we'll go through. Um, okay. The next question is, do all airports with snowy owls participate in that relocation program or is it like a select few? Uh, yeah, so we're hoping that more will, but there are probably like five to 10 airports that definitely have management um, programs that are consistently trapping and relocating snowy owls. Some of the smaller airports, um, not so much because maybe they'll have an owl or two here and there but somewhere like Logan, um, one of a Project Snowstorm uh, collaborator and founder, um, Norman Smith has been doing work there for the last 30 years or so. And like one season he had upwards of 23 owls at Logan Airport, which is kind of crazy. So in that point, they have to have somebody staffed and just trying to trap owls and relocate them and uh, hopefully mitigate some, some strikes. But but yeah, we, we would love more airports um, to do that. There is, of course, costs associated with that. Um, and they're also doing other types of wildlife mitigation from other raptors, um, coyotes, deer, things, things like that. So mm -hmm. 
All right, this I'll combine two questions. This question is, um, do we see any snowy owls around Hawk Mountain? And can you find any snowy owls in Europe? <laughs> so if you're sitting at North Lookout on a fall day, you will not see a snowy owl <laughs> flying <laughs> over. Um, but again, in some of our open spaces, um, like in Lancaster and other regions, we can see um, some of our grassland species. So don't come to Hawk Mountain to see a snowy owl, <laughs> but come to learn about snowy owls. And um, the second question was... If they're also, if you can find them in Europe. Oh, yes. Yes. So we do have colleagues studying them um, in like the Finland, um, uh, Sweden area. And there was just a reporting, this is the first time ever that snowy owls showed up in Spain. Um, and we think that they may have um, uh, taxied on a boat or something and, and got to Spain that way. But yes, these, this, is, this species has a circumpolar distribution. So they're found in Russia and Greenland, um, but a lot of researchers are, are working with the, um, those that are in North America, so. Very cool. Um, okay, this question is, do you have any advice for someone with an undergraduate degree in sustainability wanting to possibly continue education in ecology and conservation? I have been out of undergrad for four years and do not know where to go from here, but would like to start doing more environmental work. Thank you for your great research. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, my, my, my biggest thing that I would say to you is just try to get involved, um, whether you can volunteer for an organization or reach out to someone you know that is doing something that inspires you or that you would like to do and just try to strike up a conversation and ask how to get involved. I mean, that's the biggest thing. I think most people are kind of fearful, like they're not, they don't have all the credentials or they're not good enough for this. But honestly, if you just show an interest and you're excited and passionate, um, I think you'll sort of be able to find that path and, and be able to do what you wanna do. So um, yeah, get involved, reach out, talk to people as much as you can. And I think that'll help get you um, on your way. Awesome. Um, okay, I'll do a couple more. There's been like such a great flood of questions coming in. So it's hard to go through all of them. But um, another question is if the snowy owl, it seems like they don't have a problem with inhabiting the same area. Are they known to be territorial? And are there any predator birds that affect their migration or like hunting grounds? Yeah, so we, we do see some, some sort of like turf wars or if um, you know there's two owls within the same area, um, that adult females could come in and push out um, a younger male. And so we do see that, especially in areas that probably have a, a good prey base. And so um, the owls may become a little bit more territorial in that sense. Um, but, but yeah, we, we see it. And as far as other birds, like nothing really spooks a snowy owl other than a bald eagle. Um, bald eagles can can just sort of like ruffle a snowy's feather and and they'll take off and and move to another location but um they they're a pretty dominant bird so awesome um okay this question is if you happen to know what percentage of snowies are dying from starvation once they migrate south yeah this is this is a a big topic question and actually a lot of the birds that we're finding are in good health. Um, so when we're out trapping owls, a lot of them are, are, are healthy and look good and are actually, you know, have some, some weight on them. And so they're, they're in good shape. Um, the, the issue is that a lot of times the reporting covers the birds that um, are being set to, sent to vet facilities. And so of course, if a bird is injured or sick, um, the vets will tell us and we'll know, okay, this bird is sick or injured, but we have a lot of healthy owls in the population that are doing well, um, but they're not going to the vet. And so it's a little biased when we hear these stories, but as the researchers out trapping the birds, we are seeing a lot of healthy owls. And from our study, from looking at the telemetry and necropsied owls, 
um, as I mentioned, we actually saw more anthropogenic mortality. So collisions, electrocution, um, you know, the, the, the automobile collisions and the plane collisions and emaciation was a, a much smaller percentage um, in comparison to, to that. Awesome. So it's kind of a good, it's good news in the sense yeah. of the owls are good, the bad news is the things we're doing in the world are not necessarily helping them, so. Right. Um, this question is really interesting. It's, they ask if there's any research into the diets of wintering snowies compared from like Lancaster farm country versus one that is wintering along the New Jersey beaches, like if they're having different diets. That is a very great, great question. And yeah, we think that owls along the coast, um, their diets are a little bit different because they're, you know, hunting birds and species along the coast versus the ones that are um, in the farm fields. And I will say that one of the most difficult things about studying a species and wanting to know more about their prey is that it's really hard to do studies on prey, especially small mammals, because you have to go out and trap them and document them. And it's, it's really quite tricky. And so that would be a great um, project, but other, other people have done it. Um, there's been some work uh, out in the prairies that people have looked at prey and other people as well. And, um, it would be interesting to have a have a comparison. And I will say that uh, a colleague of mine at Cornell and a former uh, trainee as well, we're, um, we started a study looking at the microbiome of snowy owls. And so we are hoping to assess and compare the microbiome of snowies in the Arctic versus down here and to see if there's any differences in their bacteria as well. So, so much room for more research and more questions, yeah. And all right, let's see here. Um, this person asked, does some of your data come from eBird or can you name your sources? Is this citizen science supported? Yes, so a lot of the work that I did specifically was using movement data and that came from predominantly Project Snowstorm, which is funded um, by just people who love snowy owls and so, yeah, so a lot of it was tracking data. We did collaborate um, with uh, veterinary facilities that use those necropsy owls. Um, and Christmas bird count was the, the citizen science data set that I looked into for comparing eruptions. But yeah, majority of the work uh, came from, from the tracking study and funded by snowstorm donors. Perfect. Um, I'll combine these two questions. How many eggs do snowy owls normally lay and what is their natural lifespan? Yeah, so about on average seven eggs. Um, there have been upwards of 10 depending, you know, on prey availability um, and the average lifespan. This was a question that came up um, more recently and I'm not too sure what the oldest owl in the wild is. Um, but in captivity, I want to say definitely more than 20 years, but this is why lo doing long-term research is so important. <laughs> so we can, we can answer some of these questions, but yeah, that's sure. Um, and then I think I'll wrap it up with this last question. If anyone has a question that was not answered, um, during the program, uh, feel free to send Rebecca, an email, I guess, if Rebecca, if you want to put your email in the chat and we'll um, definitely direct any additional questions to her. Um, let's see here. My final question for you is um, what your process is for trapping these owls and um, tagging them while you're doing your research. Yeah, so um, it's all pretty standard in, in the raptor world for trapping um, raptors in general, but a lot of um, banders will use a thigh trap and um, it basically has nooses that the bird will come down on the bait and then just get caught in the noose and you run out and uh, retrieve the bird. So all things that have been you know, approved and the protocols that's humane for the owl. Um, and we are able to get the bird in hand and process it and take a bunch of measurements and learn as much about it as we can. And then we do the backpack harness with the transmitter. And so all of that um, 
takes not a long period of time and we release the owl back into the wild and it's good to go. Um, so yeah, I, I could have probably gone into more details about how we do that because it is kind of cool um, and interesting and a lot of people want to know how to do that. But feel free to email me with more questions. I'm happy to, to share that with you. Perfect. Well, thank you all so much for such amazing questions. Um, thank you, Rebecca, for an awesome presentation. Um, if anyone is interested in uh, checking out more of our both virtual programs and in-person programs, you can check out um, our website under our calendar of events. Um, I wanted to mention a few upcoming programs we have both virtually and in person if you'd like to check it out. Um, currently, every weekend through the beginning of April, we have a winter artisan series. So if you're local and want to join us for an art workshop, we have that going on. Uh, this weekend, we have a Meet Our Farmland Raptors program in person as well, if you'd like to meet some of our raptor ambassadors. And we have a common winter feeder bird ID program going on throughout the weekend. So if you're local, definitely come check us out. Um, and next week, we have two virtual programs. Um, at the same time next week, you can learn about Dr. Karen Weeb's snowy owl research as well, if you'd like to keep learning more. And that same day in the morning, we have a sanctuary story time. So if you have any young kids that would like to um, join us for a story time, we would love to have you. Thank you all so much for watching. This will be available on our YouTube channel in a few days. And yeah, thank you so much, Rebecca. Thanks everyone for tuning in. Have a, have good, a night. good night, everybody. Bye.